Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first event of 2014. Sorry for the slightly delayed start. Um, before I hand you over to Lindsay Hilson from Channel 4 News, who's chairing tonight's discussion, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we're broadcasting live. So over to Lindsay. Thank you very much, and thank you all very much. What a fantastic start to the frontline year, that you're so packed, we're so packed that you're almost on the stage. And let me apologise for the lateness. It is 100% my fault. So that's how it is. We have um, a great panel here, and I can already see in the audience, we have a great audience. I'm already seeing several people who know far more about it than I do. Um, so on my far left, we have Thomas Marwan Murtat, and he is a commentator from South Sudan. He writes for New Sudan Vision, for Sudan Tribune, and other um, outlets which may be very familiar to you. Heather Pagano from Médecins Sans Frontières was in Juba, is that right? Yes. So you're based in, back in the summer. Um, James Copnell has just come back from South Sudan. He is probably familiar to many of you as uh, the BBC's former Sudan and South Sudan correspondent. And we're going to plug his book, which I have to put my glasses on because the title <laughs> is so long. And the title is... A poisonous thorn in our hearts, Sudan and South Sudan's bitter and incomplete divorce. And that's going to be published in March, so that's something to look forward to. Mukesh Kapila has had uh, many, many guises, um, but maybe the most relevant one here is that he was the UN Secretary General's special envoy to Sudan and South Sudan before South Sudan's independence. We're also going to plug his book, which is called Against a Tide of Evil. So, um, for you, as you don't know, my name is Lindsay Hilsom. I'm the international editor of Channel 4 News. Um, I think the reason uh, to ask me to chair this was I, I spent a lot of time in Sudan and South Sudan in the 80s. And the last time I was in South Sudan was for that gloriously happy moment of uh, independence in uh, 2011. Now, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of our panelists to say a little bit, to speak for no more than five minutes. Anybody who speaks for more than five minutes um, gets a strict punishment. And um, <laughs> then we will open it to the floor for discussion. Let's go to James first, because James came back from uh, Juba just this weekend. So, James, just give us a bit of an update. <coughs> what's going on? What did, you, what did you see for yourself? Well, the obvious thing to say first is that Juba is relatively calm, that there were some gunshots over the weekend. And although the crisis started in Juba on December the 15th, uh, the violence there swiftly ended and moved out into other parts of the country with rebels taking control of the town of Bor and Bentiu and fighting in Malakal and other places. Uh, Bor has gone back and forth. The government is trying to take control of it. it says they're going to take Bentiu too as well. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that this was a political crisis at the beginning and it shouldn't be divorced from its political context, starting really with the obvious tensions between Reg Machar when he was vice president and President Salva Kiir, but also a more generalised frustration within the governing party, the SPLM, about the way uh, the party was going. Uh, around about April of last year, there was a meeting in which several people made it clear that they wanted to run for the chairmanship of the SPLM to dethrone Salva Kiir, which would almost inevitably lead to being president in the 2015 elections. That included Pagan Amum, that included Rek Machar, <coughs> probably James Waini Iga, uh, and also Rebecca Nyending. So the national convention that was due to uh, discuss this didn't happen. Political tensions grew. Uh, in July, you'll probably remember, Rek Machar and all the cabinet were sacked by President Salva Kiir. Uh, December the 6th, numerous heavyweight SPLM political figures criticised the president, talking about dictatorial tendencies. Then on the 14th, 15th, you had a meeting of the National Liberation Council uh, in which it seems as though President Salva's faction uh, won the day. And then the fighting broke out on the evening of the 15th. And the key question here now, I suppose, is was this an attempted coup, which is President Salva Kiir's version, uh, or was this an attempt to get rid of some of his rivals? And I think my personal perspective is it's too early to tell. We haven't seen enough evidence. 
but I will say that the, we haven't seen enough evidence to support the allegation that this was an attempted coup. Was it a mutiny among the presidential guard? That may be possible, but we certainly haven't seen detailed uh, accusations against the 11 political figures who were arrested, mainly the people who took part in this press conference in which Salva Kiir was uh, accused of dictatorial tendencies. Rick Mishar uh, certainly has troops loyal to him within the army. Many of them have subsequently taken up arms and <coughs> taken place in the fighting in, in Bor, in, in Bentu, elsewhere in the country. Uh, and the other interesting dimension to me here is the international dimension, the way in which regional countries, and in particular Uganda, have expressed pretty strong support for Salva Kiir. President Museveni saying even that he would defeat the rebels militarily, saying he was speaking on behalf of Igad, but he's been the most prominent, and that I think has bolstered uh, Salva Kiir and his positions and also pushed Riek Machar to the negotiating table. And of course we now have negotiations in, in Addis Ababa, as many of you will be aware, but that's stumbling uh, because Riek Machar's side want people released, his political allies released, and the latest suggestion from Juba seemed to be that the talks could move to Juba uh, and so the political detainees could talk during the day and go back to jail in the evening. But if that is the case, I suspect that's going to be rejected by Rek Mashar and his, his team. Uh, yeah, so the other issue, of course, is although we have talks and under pressure, uh, we don't have a cessation of hostilities, so the fighting continues, whether it's for Bor or for Bentiu or uh, other places that may arise. Yay, I think we had clashes in a couple of days ago as well. Uh, so the key issue from an external perspective, and I think for a lot of South Sudanese, is finding a way to get both sides to agree to stop fighting uh, and at least start talking properly. Thank you very much, James. Um, Heather Pagano, you're obviously, when it comes to South Sudan, whenever there is fighting, our thoughts turn very quickly to the humanitarian situation because people are so on the edge, they, they are so poor. Tell us a little bit about, about that, about what's happening uh, in the humanitarian situation, what needs to be done and, and why it has deteriorated so quickly. Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> the situation in South Sudan is deteriorating quite quickly from MSF's perspective. We've worked in the country for the past 30 years and we have uh, big programs in uh, nine of the ten states that we've been running for a long time in a lot of uh, locations. The situation is quite concerning on the ground and I, I just came back a, a couple of weeks, about a week, two weeks ago. Um, and from Juba and the thing that struck me most when I when I arrived there after the clashes began in Juba was the speed with which everything changes on the ground and that makes it incredibly difficult to plan a proper aid response so I mean even today actually this morning I was writing my notes on what I was going to say with all the information um, from the field that I had all the up-to-date information and this afternoon I had a phone call with my colleagues on the ground and things had changed already so it's it's so fast and it makes it really difficult in such a big country with very little logistical capacity and by that I mean you have to fly everything in the road there's not very good roads have all of your materials it's really complicated so I thought I would um speak about four particular areas um, that are a big humanitarian concern from us, uh, for us at the moment. I'll start with Juba. So we're working in um, the UN camps where 35,000 displaced have gathered inside Juba and the situation there is pretty dire. The, it's so cramped and um, people are living, uh, taking turns sleeping at night because there's not enough places for them to lie there. Um, they're shuttling, sh sheltering underneath these little trees. Um, we had a physicist actually in our team, he's a physics teacher in another life and he did a, um, a calculation that the population density in one of the camps there is 10 times that of the population density in Mumbai which everyone knows is massively massively overcrowded so that gives a picture of how these people are living the water situation is is quite bad and people tell us that they're afraid to go home they're afraid that they'll be attacked based on uh, on their ethnicity so it's a really concerning situation and when you have people living so closely together the, the risk for disease outbreak is quite high so we were preparing for everything that we can in case there's cholera, measles, measles vaccination campaigns, but it's a, it's a tenuous situation at best. Um, next, I'll talk quickly about Awarial, which is in Lake State. Um, people fled there from the fighting in Boer. There's about 75,000 people there at the moment. And again, the same problem, water is a massive, massive issue. The, there's five boreholes in the town that normally has 10,000 people, and they run dry by 10 a.m. 
So people are going to the Nile and taking water directly from there to bathe, cook, eat, drink. It's, and obviously the Nile, if you can imagine, is probably not the cleanest place to get your water. So um, again, the possibility for disease outbreak is quite high and we're really concerned about it. Um, then a, a good example, and this is uh, two, two things that I just learned this afternoon. One is um, about Ben Chu. So we had a, a surgical team based there in the hospital. Um, we were working alongside the ICRC, the Red Cross, and also in the UN compound there were large, lots of displaced people. And our teams um, had to relocate this afternoon at 1.30 um, to our hospital in Lair, which is about three hours away, because of imminent attacks that we were told are coming to the town. And we had to relocate our staff, even though as an emergency organization that works in conflicts, Benchu is where we want to be, and we want to go back as soon as we can, but it's so volatile and insecure that it changes so quickly that these sort of things happen. Um, so that's an example of how quickly things happen. Um, and finally, uh, in Lenkian, which is in northern Zhonglei, and Zhongle is one of the sort of flashpoint areas, obviously, with everything with boar. We've received lots of wounded from boar that have walked three, four days with gunshot wounds to our hospital there in search of, of safe health care. And actually, this is um, really new information from today, 30,000 people, 30,000 um, IDPs internally displaced, um, have shown up in Lankian in the past uh, two, three days. Um, so the, the number that the UN is saying right now, about 200,000 people being displaced, those 30,000 weren't even included. So this is literally just brand new information, which gives a picture of how many people are out there in the bush that we can't reach. Who else is out there that needs help that we can't get to because it's logistically difficult, because it's so insecure. And we're, yeah, after 30 years of working there, we're really concerned, and it's not easy. A lot of organizations have been forced to withdraw from or feel that they can't continue to work there safely. We've had to uh, downsize our own size of our teams to non we pulled out non-essential staff, even though all of our programs are still running. But mean it means with the departure of other organizations that there's gaps for us to fill, and we can't we can't do it all. And people are going to suffer, and they are suffering. And it's um it's a quite concerning it's a concerning time for us. When you talk about the security situation for your staff, have there been direct <coughs> threats? to aid staff or are you talking about a general insecurity there's going to be fighting in Bentiu because the government is trying to dislodge the rebels there? It's a good question. We haven't had any direct attacks against us at this time but we have had them multiple times in the past in South Sudan. Um, we have been in the wrong place <coughs> at the wrong time and in multiple places our hospitals have been looted and sacked in the past mm -hmm. and um, and you know in these moments we have to we have to take this horrible decision that no one ever wants to take mm -hmm. where we want to be there and we know we, we can't stay. We can't stay for that, for that time period and we'll go back in as soon as we can. But um, it's, it's just one of those, uh, th and there have been, and we're really concerned about um, reports about it, attacks against aid workers. There have been some um, NGOs that have had some, some incidents since the, the violence has begun. But thankfully, fingers crossed, knock on wood, none mm. for us so far. Thank you. Um, Thomas, how has it come to this? I was there in July 2011, everyone was dancing in the streets, it was a most fantastic atmosphere, people were full of joy about freedom, independence, liberation. How has it come to this? Explain it to us. Yeah, exactly. In the same way people were so happy <coughs> on the day of the independence, I think uh, the same could be said about how they're feeling at the moment. Everybody's feeling distraught. If there is anything common now among South Sudanese, is they're asking exactly the same question. Uh, why, how did we arrive here? Uh, even at the level of the conflict between the people or the leaders from both sides, uh, the, each group is feeling uh, quite sad and quite shocked uh, and, and probably there's a feeling of, of guilt and remorse why, why they ended up there. Uh, even though they're still insisting on their op opposing positions, I think what is still in common, even amongst the two camps, is, okay, long live South Sudan. But, you know, it's a very strange way of them, of the two camps who are fighting and killing each other and displacing all these people now. It's a very strange thing to, it's a very strange way mm. to show it, that they love the country. So there are uh, underlying factors, of course, uh, that led to this. Some of them are historic, which we cannot go into. But the main factor really is that since 2005, since the agreement was signed, and since, and since uh, which is actually the, the first establishment of the current South Sudanese government. So we cannot just say that the government has been in power for just two years. It actually has been in power since 2005. Uh, the population feels that they have been let down. There hasn't been the delivery of services that they were expecting. Uh, there is also a dichotomy between the population and then an emerging class of very seemingly very wealthy people who have got a connection with the government and that is across the board it's not even ethnic uh, 
So this feeling has led the, the population to feel very, very agitated. And there has been a lot of complaint which the government has felt or the leading class has felt. And I think this is what led to pressures amongst, among the ruling party, the leadership of the SPLM, that actually ended up to where we are now. Because um, <coughs> the, the SPLM itself has a long history and has different elements amongst, um, um, amongst it. And one of them, for example, is there is uh, a, a block that has the ideology of the old New Sudan, which were the followers of, the SP, of John Garang, our previous leader. And then there are elements who are traditional South Sudanese nationalists who don't want trouble with the North, who wants independence, and so on. There is that tension. But there's also the tension of the uh, vice president or the ex-vice president, uh, Riyad Machar, who has a history of having broken away from the movement before, previously. And that had lost, uh, led to the death of so many South Sudanese. Uh, actually, some people say that the South Sudanese, the number of South Sudanese who died as a result of internal wars, primarily between Dink and Noir, internally within the SPLA, uh, could be equated to the number of people who have died as a result of the North-South War in, in total. So, uh, so there is the Riyadh Machar factor, even though Riyadh Machar returned before the referendum, before the independence actually, uh, to the falls of the SPLA, uh, there was almost an un unwritten rule, uh, you know, a, an open secret that Riyadh Machar will never be allowed to ru rule South Sudan. Uh, but that did not actually stop Ma Riyadh Machar trying to be the rule of South Sudan one day. So because of all these tensions, because of the corruption, because of Riyadh Machar's ambition, uh, all this led to Kir famous reshuffle of basically throwing out his entire cabinet and saying, okay, I'm going to have some te technocrats. It doesn't matter whether they are SPLA, SPLM or not. They're going to be South Sudanese with various uh, experiences. And let's see whether they can deliver to the population. Uh, the same thing to Riyadh Machar. You're not going to, you know, while I'm here, I'm not going to let you stand uh, against me. So uh, we, that move seemed to have gone smoothly. But obviously, things were brewing underneath, and there were a lot of pressures, uh, people pulling in different directions. So th it was not surprising to many people that it blew up. The extent to which it blew up, of course, is surprising. But I think people were f feeling that something was going to happen. So I'm going to come across to Mukesh. So you have a situation where Riek Machar, who is the vice president, indicates that he's going to challenge Salva Kiir, the president. And this is a long-term rivalry. Salva Kiir gets rid of Riek. He gets rid of other people in the government who he sees as a threat. This is all back in July, yes? And so it's, it's brewing. Mukesh, should the international community, which really was the midwife to South Sudan, particularly the Americans, is there something that they should have done back in July? Because the whole idea of this government was, it spe was supposed to be a broad church. It was not supposed to be something where Salva could basically get rid of Riek because we all knew that would cause a hell of a lot of trouble. And yet, everybody seemed, seemed paralyzed. Should the international community have done something earlier, and if so, what? And what should it do now? Mm. Such an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. Yeah. Well, three or four points, perhaps, as a preliminary. Uh, firstly, I think we should keep our nerve. If you look at the history of post-freedom governments, if you like, post-freedom thing, country after country, it is not unusual for there to be turbulence in a country immediately after it kind of becomes free with whatever history. So what we have in South Sudan is uh, history taking its course. History that is partly the incomplete process of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement that led to the original birth of South Sudan and history in terms of the natural evolution of statehood, in a way. If you look at countries around the world, I mean, I don't know what the early days of the United States were like, but they were pretty, pretty tough, <laughs> in a way. So the fact is, I don't know about the, what, the, what the international community should do is to be more tolerant. The idea that you could impose a Western-style liberal democracy where winner-takes-all approach, and you have the rituals of a mature state suddenly transplanted on it and expect everything to work as if it was in Westminster. It was complete nonsense. So in a, in, in a sense, uh, you know, we're coming down to earth f for the fact that it's an organic uh, uh, process and it is in the context of a country that had very few functioning institutions, that had a legacy of great poverty and such like. So that's, I think, my first point, uh, uh, point to make. The second point to, I, I would make also is 
that uh, I very much hope whatever the international community is doing, it doesn't rush to making a, a paper agreement between the warring factions. The worst thing that would happen would be, uh, you know, Museveni or Igat pointing a metaphorical gun at the people sitting in Addis and saying, right, sign this piece of paper. We know what happens when people sign pieces of paper without the underlying causes being addressed. Well, there's a reason why we have strife in South Sudan. It is a reason of partly the colonial uh, legacy of, uh, of, of Khartoum, partly because it's 50 years of a, of a region, big, I'm thinking of the biggest Sudan region, where uh, there is this uh, various forms of conflicts have been, have been, have been going on. We, partly it is also the fact that we have the uh, oil equation in this, and uh, where there is far too much focus on the oil, as opposed to the fact that actually it would be much better for the oil to stay under the ground until the country is ready to actually benefit uh, from it. So what we need to do is certainly to have a ceasefire. That's what the international community should mm. be doing. It should certainly be arguing for a ceasefire so the humanitarian consequences are mitigated or reduced, as, uh, as, as, as you were saying. But then take your time to find the right form of governance and the right solutions to the underlying problems of, of South Sudan. And that takes time. My worry is that, that uh, IGAD and African Union and the neighbors will want to declare victory as soon as possible and rush into some kind of uh, half-baked uh, agreement, of which we've seen plenty, uh, plenty in the past. But don't you have to have some kind of agreement? Because you, you have got, you've got a weak leader. Salva Kiir, I think we can all agree, is weak. He is not John Garang. He doesn't have the same skills that Garang had. And Riek is an angry and ambitious man. Surely there is an urgency to try and sort something out. There's an urgency to, to stop the fighting and the urgency to address the human impacts, if you like, of the violence. But I don't see any particular urgency uh, in terms of a, dis a future political dispensation. I think if, we, if, you, if you are too urgent about finding the right political solution for South Sudan, mm. then we're going to repeat this thing again and again and again. I think there's elections in 2015. Yes. And uh, uh, currently there's a draft constitution only. It's not a real mm. constitution. Okay. So there is, a, if you like, a bit of space to figure out what is the right form of democracy? We know it must be demo democracy. I mean, there's no other alternative mm -hmm. but to democracy. But there are many, many forms of democracy. So a, a form of democracy that addresses uh, inclu uh, exclusion, uh, meaning it's inclusive, that uh, actually addresses some of the root causes of the grievances, including the historical causes, and finds a way of power sharing and so on and so forth for the future, may be the answer. Tell and that is not going to be achieved. Tell me, tell me about this democracy. I don't know this kind of power sharing no, democracy. No, because you live in Britain. Exactly. So, <laughs> no, but that's You're right. divided. So, you have the coalition so government. Where, where can we see this? What, give me a good example of that, because we, we're all looking for it. Give me a good example. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I think that there are... Uh, now you put me on the spot. I, uh, that's uh, why uh, I'm here. That's that, why yeah, that's you're why, here. Uh, uh, that's why yeah, they're here. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what I do know is in countries like Sierra Leone uh, and mm. uh, elsewhere, where I've got kind of past experience of, yes. What they've done is that in the immediate post-conflict period yes. or the post-freedom yes. period, whatever you want to call it, uh, if you like, you see, there are, if you like, transitional arrangements, even in Liberia, yes. where a way is found to actually accommodate different groups. Now, I know SPLM is a broad church, and this yes. is what Silva Kiri is, and you're quite exactly. right when, uh, when, when, when you said that. But the fact is that peace and society is built from the bottom up, not top down. If you're going to impose from Juba a form of a kind of ritualistic uh, process of inclusion, it's not going to work. Remember that uh, this is a vast country uh, where most people are operating outside the uh, kind of cash economy for ever since Adam and Eve, uh, in a way. Under those circumstances, you need a much more grassroots approach and local democracy and local governance. And from that, one builds up national institutions and national and, and national. Can structures. I put that before we throw? It, can I put that to you, Thomas? What, what, because we're now going on to a sort of a longer term solution how, how do you how do you see that i think there's certainly there's a point there about the grassroots thing and i think yes. during the war for example one of the successes or, or, or you know success stories of the SPL is because people are, were organized at grassroots level mm -hmm. so you have terms like payam and boomers and things like that and the, SPL, the local can people you explain to, to us what that means uh, these are un units of administration so you have for example uh, south sudan has uh, states, 10 states, and within the states we have counties, and within counties we have payams, and within payams we have regions. So, um, here maybe things like wards or, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or district councils, things like that. So, these were 
the levels at which the party were, or, was organized. And people were actually, local people were able to discuss these things amongst them. And, and things were pushed to uh, mm -hmm. the level of, you know, the party. And does that uh, not exist? Does that system not exist anymore? The, S the SPLM has lost its way since it came. I mean, they came yeah. into power. And suddenly, something seemed to be missing, whether it was the death of John Garang or whether it was because of, you know, the shock of being in office and, and you, know, uh, you know, the wonderful things of life. Uh, we don't understand, but something was lost there. Right, so that, so that local administration, it sort of ceased to, to function properly? It has to be, re I think, re-established. Okay. But obviously, there's a question of capacity, you know. I think yeah. where the international community has really failed or where it's actually needed is that South Sudan does, has not accounted for its money. Uh, South Sudan has earned close to 8 mm. billions or more since, mm. since, since 2005. And m all of this money, or most of it, has been actually wasted. Uh, it's been wasted or stolen? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of it has been stolen. Most of it has been uh, stolen. Uh, and there's a culture during the, during the liberation movement, there was a culture where John Garang would raise you know, uh, revenue or money or donated money or even cattle sold by the South Sudanese in the markets in order to help the military. And this money would be cash. And Garang, Garang would say to a comrade, take this money and go and buy weapons. And the comrade will, three million, the, the, com the comrade might spend a million, but the two million would not be accounted for and he would not be asked. So we had this situation where cash was everywhere. And when they came into the government, they didn't establish a system. So yeah. this mentality, this system continued and that's what led to the waste and to the, uh, you know, to the problems we're in. I think one of the first things that should have been done is a system. Uh, the West should not be there putting things like social issues first and cultural issues first, like, you know, should girls be married at 13? That, that is important, but that's not what South Sudan needs at the moment. What South Sudan needs is, okay, how do we look after our money? Where is the money coming from? How has it been spent? And the West has done nothing to help well, the government Well, I don't there. know if that, I mean, I... I not enough. Okay, not enough, not but enough. There, there are, there certainly are programs with the South Sudanese government, are there not? I mean, I, I can't remember what they're called, the wretched um, Adam Smith Institute. They're yeah, the, the World Bank was there, but the World, yeah, World they're, Bank they're was accused, to were accused to be as inefficient as, as the government. That but also, international community, the international community should not be exerting pressure on the South Sudanese to get the oil flowing. I mean, the fact is you need institutional capacity to absorb the money that comes at oil. So I agree about whatever you say about corruption, I don't know. But I mean, if this is what it is, it is. But we have to understand that the corruption isn't just a consequence of local misbehavior. No, it is also the question, it is also the incentives the international community s says. So people talk about investing in South Sudan. Well, they're not investing in South Sudan. They're exploiting South Sudan. They want the oil out, partly because of pressure from Khartoum and partly because of all the oil companies and all the of it and where is it going to go to except into the into the pockets of uh, wherever it, these things uh, go into so lay off the back of South Sudan would be what the international community should be should have been doing now you said you used a very interesting word there and the word was cartoon James tell me a bit about <laughs> I saw the uh, Omar this al my friend is sitting here that I had to say <laughs> Omar al Bashir was in Juba yesterday tell me a bit about the role if any of Sudan in all this mess? Well, the relationship immediately after separation was very, very difficult indeed. Um, both sides were accused of sponsoring each other's rebels, which my friend from the MC will certainly deny, but uh, seems a fair amount of evidence for it. Uh, both sides fought each other directly on the border in April 2012. And then they did sign an agreement in September, the September agreements, nine agreements, in fact, uh, to regulate uh, oil flows and trade, which trade is almost more important than oil, actually, because so many people, I think about 13 million, are meant to live in the border states mm. to trade back and forth with each other. The Sudanese have 160 different commodities, apparently, that they only export to South Sudan. It's vital for both economies, for the South Sudanese, for the Sudanese. Mm. And so in the last year or so, uh, there's actually been a slightly better relationship between Khartoum and Juba with its problems, with its difficulties, but a sense on both sides that maybe the attempt to destroy the other's economy or see the other side collapse had failed and actually a, a sort of mutually assured future could be beneficial. So every time uh, South Sudanese oil is exported, it goes through Sudanese pipelines, and there's a transitional finance agreement uh, over the next few years of something like $3 billion that the Sudanese, Sudanese government will get if the oil keeps flowing, essentially, as well as a, as well as a little bit per every barrel. Um, and the South Sudanese can't export their oil without Sudan. 
So for personal reasons, for trade reasons, for economic reasons, there's a strong argument for the mutual dependence or aid of each state. Uh, there are still people on both sides in both uh, governing elites who don't want anything to do with that, who are hardliners, who look for the destruction of the other side, but their voices haven't been as loud in the last year. And so when Omar al-Bashir came to Juba, uh, he came, he said, as, as a friend and essentially uh, to support Salva Kiir. Uh, and for the first time in a quarter of a century, it was more or less possible to believe that, I think. Um, now, lots of people in South Sudan will have their doubts because he supported Rek Mashar in the split uh, in 1991. Uh, one former minister told me that he thought it was still possible that Rek Mashar could get support from, from Khartoum, uh, that that could be a possible future. But I think at the moment, the suggestion is that uh, Omar al-Bashir is uh, sticking with Salva Kiir. So, and just again before, I mean, I think it's very important that we understand what happened in 1991. I mean, I know you, you made reference to it. I don't know if one of the two of you wants to briefly explain to us what happened in 1991. The reason I think it's very important is because I think some people might see what's happening now as either a rerun of what happened in 91 or a continuation or a distortion or whatever. And I think for us to understand what's going on, we, we need to understand 91. Can you, can you do what happened in 1991 in um, 1 minute 30? <laughs> Come on, you work for the BBC. I, that kind of thing all I the usually time. get 45 seconds, so yeah. a minute 30. I don't yeah. know what to do with it. Uh, uh, so the SPLA were fighting against the government in Khartoum, but in 1991, Rek Mashar and several others split away. They accused John Garang of dictatorial behavior. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean about history repeating itself? Go on. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah. subsequently, you got southern Sudanese infighting, which has been referred to already, and in particular the Boer massacre, which Amnesty International said at least 2,000 people, Dinka from the Boer area, were killed by forces loyal to Rek Mashar, including uh, an ethnic militia known as the White Army. Now, roll well forward 22 whatever years it is, uh, Rek Mashar has again split away. This is something that is referred to very uh, openly by Salva Kiir, he accuses of being a prophet of doom and rekindles memories of 1991 and many people in Bora are scared of a similar attack because actually this time Rex forces, including the White Army, which he has admitted are again under his control, took Bora again. And that period in the 90s led to many, many thousands of people being killed in often ethnically motivated clashes between the Nur and the Dinka, the two biggest groups, and so there's a fear of history repeating itself. And do you think that's why the fighting spread so quickly because that's the other thing which I think took our breath away that you know one minute there's a, a mutiny or a, a fight in the pre amongst the presidential guard between the, you know, the these people in Juba and then suddenly there's fighting mm. everywhere mm. is that because yeah. of the memories of 91 or, or why definitely I mean may I ask I mean very yes, good please, question, James but if, yes. I, if, I may, if I may add there's a very important factor of the split of 19, uh, 1991 Sudan then was a very impoverished country. Uh, oil had not been extracted. Yeah. Um, the oil fields were known where they were. Sudan was trying to reach them, but the, you know, the SPLA was in control. After this split, because the majority of that area, unity area where we're talking about at the moment, an upper, uh, upper Nile uh, area, uh, dominated by, by Riyadh Machar. So when the split happened, uh, the SPLA could not reach those areas. Riyadh Machar reached a truce with Khartoum. And within months, Hortum got hold of the oil fields yeah. that they could not, you know, get for 10 years of, of war. So I think that's a very important factor. Sudan, Hortum, Sudan was able then to bring in, uh, you know, uh, a company from, from Canada, which managed to extract the oil and fund itself, modernize the army, and nearly mm -hmm. crush the ice period. So that's something that's very important. People hold Riyadh Machar responsible for that. Good. Okay, um, let us get some questions going. Now, um, anybody who's seen me share things before know I have a low tolerance for ranters. <laughs> very, very low tolerance for ranters. So, please, if you want to say who you are, that's great. And if you have an affiliation, but question, please, and no political statements. Yes. Um, I'm Carolyn Heyman from Peace Direct. Um, our partner in South Sudan has been doing exactly what you talk about, um, creating... Um, peace committees in unity state to deal with outbreaks of violence so that's and, and it's not a question I'm sorry I wanted to express uh. what we've been told by our partner about the situation um, so the first thing is 
um, he feels that the violence is really getting out of control. So I don't think I feel at all like Mukesh that mm. this is something we can just allow. Apparently, it's no longer Nua Dinka. It's people settling old scores in really horrible ways. And his request is, please, can we have more UN peacekeepers able to actually do something? Right. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, in terms of the humanitarian situation, a lot of people aren't in camps. They're in Nairobi. So um, their houses in Nairobi was 20, 25 people. And where do they get the food from? And I think this is a new kind of humanitarian um, crisis that we're seeing it also in Syria, that people don't want to go to the camps for all sorts of reasons. Mm. And I think we need to think about what's the response um, in a situation where people are going to cities, but the people they are staying with don't have the means to support them. Okay. Thank you very Let much. Let me put to, to Mukesh that question about that issue about the UN peacekeepers. Um, what she's he what Karen is hearing from her partners on the ground is we want more UN peacekeepers now. How, how would you see that? I would say that the track record of UN peacekeepers is somewhere between abominable and dismal. Mm. The peacekeeping <coughs> operations in Sudan in Darfur in this case, also in South Sudan, costing about a billion dollars uh, a year, most expensive in the world, have had least impact. The last thing you want is UN peacekeepers, <laughs> bluntly. You want U UN assistance agencies, you want UN humanitarian aid, you want UN development aid, you want o UN political aid, but you cannot, UN peacekeepers, unless you're going to flood the country with 100,000 UN uh, uh, troops with uh, the mandate to go with it, are next to useless. So no is the answer. Well, because why, I why, tell, me, tell me why you think they're so useless. What is it that makes them so useless? Well, in which country do you know? Sudan. Of? Talk about, Su yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Sudan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm. well, if you look at the case of Darfur, which is yes. the world's biggest peacekeeping operation, a billion dollars a year, uh, you know, the situation in Darfur is as bad as ever as 10 years ago. We are now at the 10th anniversary of, of, of Darfur. And uh, we have uh, the same numbers of displaced and refugees we had before, even in worse, etc. So, you know, as global taxpayers, why are you paying a billion dollars a year for Darfur peacekeeping? You and African mm -hmm. Union joint hybrid force uh, peacekeeping, and yet you have the ongoing violence. Now, in the case of South Sudan, the issue is how, how is a UN peacekeeper going to bring about peace between the sovereign government of Salva Kiir, which is still the elected government, whatever you may think of all the mm -hmm. uh, uh, bad governance aspects, and what is in fact an armed in insurgency. There is no Security Council resolution uh, that uh, will be allowed that will get in the way of that. You don't need that. What you need is a good office's UN political function <laughs> along with the African Union, and this is, I think, what they're, what they're, what they're mm -hmm. trying to do. If you've got a billion dollars to spend on peacekeeping, then please spend it on actually trying to build grassroots, like the sort of work that Peace Direct does, and others, to build community reconciliation, all the investment in community peace building capacities. And by and large, the UN is not suited to building peace capacities in a country. You can impose peacekeeping, if you wish, for a temporary period in a particular theater. Mm -hmm. But by and large, all these things unveil. Today, the world has moved on. There is very little scope for UN peacekeeping almost anywhere in the world. Uh, world really and we see this in country after country after country but I get your point we need international intervention to help bring about peace I think that's your general point but UN peacekeeping in the formal sense of the world is, yes. the, is the wrong way to do Talk it to, okay more questions um, let's go to this gentleman here and then to Liz Blunt yeah, yeah um, thank you very much for an out outstanding um, remarks um, my name's Ewan Grant I'm the former intelligence analyst in customs and excise for transnational organized crime in the ex-Soviet countries and after I left I did work with the um, former KGB in Ukraine and some very interesting things there in relation to arms supplies mm -hmm. and logis arms logistics maintenance in Africa. Um, had some very interesting conversations and um, eyebrows raised and so on. My question would have been about the money, but that there's a complex one, so make it quick. Uh, r relation to the preparedness of the international community to limit damage and to be ready to go back and soon and achieve as much, how much preparation and contingencies were made, and particularly what was the liaison between UNMIS UN uh, civilian field and UN 
uh, administrative and UN Nairobi to prepare for trouble mm. in view of the fact that you've all said mm. there were rumblings and he had previous. Um, I have to say um, my views on the UN are much more in line with these gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, anybody, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to the question. Does anybody know the answer? To, if you pass that to Lizzie. Do you know, anybody know the answer to the question? How, how prepared were the different bits of the UN for um, a crisis like this? Anybody know the answer? James, did you come across that? Too? I mean, I think... Uh, yeah, they, politically they will have predicted it was coming. Um, certainly they moved relatively quickly to ask for more troops. I think it's probably fair to say that they were only ever going to get more troops once the crisis uh, happened, and they're struggling to get them in now yeah. anyway. You know, they've got a commitment to, I think, 5,500 more troops, but actually getting the countries to commit to that and then the logistics of getting people involved takes a long time. Um, what the, I'm not a particularly big fan of the peacekeeping uh, mission. What they have been able to do essentially is protect their bases. And there are something like, yeah, and that's... Well, not, that's important. That's there are important people sheltering because there are, in those bases. Exactly. There are 60, tens of thousands. I think, people yeah, sheltering yeah. in those bases. And yeah. other than uh, one attack in Okobo um, and some mortar attacks, I think, in Bor, mm. largely the civilians in those areas have been protected. And 60,000 is, yeah, is not nothing. What they haven't been able to do, and even with 5,000 extra troops, which they're getting, will not be able to do, as I understand it, is go outside the bases, is patrol, is put themselves in between uh, the warring mm. parties. That would require both many more men, many more resources, but also, I think, a different mentality. And a different mandate. Uh, no, I think they have the mandate to do it. Do they, they have the mandate to protect civilians. They have the ma Chapter 7 mandate. Mm, right. But there is not a willingness on behalf of the troop providing countries mm. or possibly the mission, given their resources, mm. to do that. And I think that would happen. Let, let me ask Heather a question. Uh, in the time that you were there, was a kind of political and then military crisis like this predicted? I mean, were, were you always aware that this could happen at any moment or not? Well, <clears throat> I think around this time of the year in general, actually, we have extra preparedness in place because this is the dry season. And dry season is when fighting takes place in South Sudan, traditionally over cattle and things like that. If someone has a crystal ball that can predict what happens in South Sudan, I would definitely like one. I mean, the teams would because I didn't think anyone knew that it was going to be quite this bad. I mean, we had extra um, extra supplies and everything ready to go in, and we, but it's, it's this scale and this fast, I don't think that we, we expected it to be on this level. Okay, um, Liz Blunt. Uh, yes, I'm Elizabeth Blunt. I'm a journalist mostly for Irin News. Um, I wondered if one of the speakers or more of the speakers would like to say something about the South Sudan army because it seems from the reports I've been reading that most of the fighting has been army on army. Mm. Yeah, very good question. Um, Thomas, can you take that one? The South Sudan army, it's yeah, yeah, fighting I mean, themselves, fighting each other. Ab absolutely, because basically what happened when, when the fallout started in Juba, like we mentioned, on the 9th of the 15th of, of, of December, it very quickly, Riyadh Macha was able to leave the town and it spread all over the country. <laughs> and within the SPLA, SPLA, the army itself, we have to remember that uh, the SPLA is composed of the original SPLA, uh, plus all the rest that had been in the SPLA in the past, but had defected with different you know, militias that were back back at home. There had been uh, an attempt to absorb them, more, and more or less successfully. So the SPLA that we have at the moment is an inter integrated army made up of the original uh, skeleton, the SPLA, that John Grang led, and the group that Riek led, plus many, many other uh, militia groups that Khartoum used to support that have now been totally integrated. They've trained together, they've been refurbished together, they've got uniforms together, they have the same equipment. So when these events happen, two commanders, the commander in Bantu, um, James, James Kong, and the commander in Jongle, who was actually there protecting Jongle against David Yao Yao, uh, and he had be been given... No, I'm going to stop you there. Crypto. David Yao Yao, the Murale rebellion. Somebody, can you just give us a bit of background? So there's been another rebellion going on, which yes. we haven't paid much attention no, to internationally. Just explain that very briefly. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had an election in 2010, and as a result of that election, as in common in places like South Sudan, there's often a fallout. And as a result, there was many, many rebellions, and one of them, the, the last one is this David Yaya one, which is quite significant. 
and the government in, in, in Juba had been trying to put a lot of resources there and this very famous strong commander uh, Peter Gadet was put uh, in Jongle to, to, to try and basically uh, defeat and deal with David Yawiyaw. But on hearing what had happened in Juba uh, and, and the defection of Riyad Machar, he immediately uh, declared Thank support for it. So by default, Jongle was, uh, Bor fell immediately because it was under him. And also, uh, you know, Bantu fell under James Kong. So when we say army against army, yes, that's <coughs> what's happening. So would it be fair to say that, the, S, that the, the South Sudanese army is really a grouping of different warlords with their men and that those men are actually more loyal to their commander than they would be to the broader South Sudan army, is that fair? There have been an attempt to mix them, but you know we mustn't forget ethnicity in South Sudan, it, re it runs deep mm -hmm. and it's always there bubbling on the surface, even, th even though really, fairly, to speak fairly, this conflict at the, at the leadership level com mm -hmm. is composed of, uh, each group is composed of different ethnic groups. But underneath, there's always that threat that, you know, mm -hmm. um, you only have to be from a certain region for the commander to say, okay, anybody under my command, this is the guy we're going to support. And if you're not going to support them, mm -hmm. we're going to crush you. And that's basically what happened. So people who, who disagreed with, with these mutinies would have been killed. Okay. All right, because, um, so Martin Plout at the back and then... Have you got a... Oh, you've got my friend, yes. Good. Yeah, uh, just one quick point and then one question. Uh, I just think in all the terrible things that are happening, we shouldn't forget the plight of about 200,000 people from uh, Blue Nile and South Kurfan who fled into the south to look for some kind of succor in the refugee camps. Some of those refugee camps are now close to being abandoned because they're too dangerous. And you have those people who are in the most dire situation. We just shouldn't forget them. It's where are they? Are they up in unity or where are they? In yeah, they're, they're, they're up on, on the borders yeah, between the, the border two border states. And it's just yeah. appalling their situation. Yeah. Uh, the one question, uh, yeah. you know, we, we, Mukesh is, is highly skeptical of the UN. The UN at least are there. Where is the African Union? Mm, where is the African Good question. Uh, let me just ask Heather, do you know anything about the, the refugees that Martin is talking about? Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, no, it's true. So the, the two sort of big groupings of refugees are in Maban County um, and in Yida. And actually it's something we're, we're increasingly concerned about because uh, many NGOs, like uh, international organizations, mm. as I said, have, have departed um, uh, given the insecure, insecure situation. Mm. And it's challenging to work there, not placing any blame or anything. But it does place additional strain on our team. So, for example, in Doro, one of the big camps, we run all the primary health care. So when you go see the doctor, normal, mm. this normal sort of thing. The secondary health care, when you need to be admitted to the hospital, that partner has left. So now we've got to do both. So mm. this is an example of um, these sort of uh, times where what, what do you do? I mean, we're not going to be able to fill all the gaps. Um, we hope more people will come in. And the situation in Yida is a bit more unstable, but in Maban it's relatively okay. There hasn't been mm -hmm. massive So people have stayed in the camps. They haven't fled. Yeah, and well, that they're in a, this is exactly the point. If the level of assistance decreases in these camps, because they're 100% reliant on, on the international assistance they receive there, then where are they going to go? They're not going to go back into Blue Nile or into, mm. into Kordofan. Sure. So they're particularly vulnerable, and it is a, it's a big worry. Um, well, where is, so I, I think on that, I mean, actually, I'm very glad you, you brought that up because I, I really think that, uh, you know, we mustn't forget this uh, 200, 250,000 people. I think this is also a reflection on our international humanitarian system. So, you know, the first shots are fired or, uh, and all the international humanitarians flee, okay? Now, with deepest and bluntest of respect to international humanitarian organizations here, and what kind of humanitarian solidarity is this, if you like, you see? And today, you know, if it is, I know it's about the risk of international people there, but if you are in the humanitarian profession, if you are an international humanitarian organization, and you're raising money on the backs of the needs of these vulnerable people, then you should be prepared to take the risks and stay there and not run away. Yes, it might mean somebody might get killed, somebody might get wounded, it could be me, or it could be you, or it could be my loved one. That's the risk we take, if you like, see. So one of my commentaries on this situation is the disgraceful nature of the fact that the international community, whether it's diplomats, whether it's US Embassy evacuating non-essential staff, so-called non-essential staff uh, going, etc., and the poor people are left behind. 
So hey, can I just make a point on that? Yeah. Oh, maybe Heather would like to make a point on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you also have to distinguish between what is an, uh, an emergency humanitarian organization like MSF yes. and what is a development organization. Yes, so a lot of the people who have have left um, South Sudan was quote unquote post conflict. It was stable. So a lot of the organizations that have left aren't. They don't have the same sort of evacuation ability that MSF has. They don't have their own plan. And they would also be useless. And they're not. They're yeah, they're the what's the point of saying if you're doing <laughs> capacity building in the Ministry of Blah Blah? Well, I think this is. A, this is a, I think. I think this is a false dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy between humanitarian workers and development workers. I think in the situation of South Sudan, which is two and a half years into independence, which has got mixed needs, it's got internal oh, developmental yeah. problems, it has got internal problems of displacement, which precede the present situation mm. plus the refugees. The idea that you have two categories of people: one blue and one green; one called humanitarians, one called developments the others can one can take risk and the other cannot take it's nonsense right. i think we have to that's deal with the situation okay, as it is well, okay but i'm also asked another question has anybody seen the well, african that's stimulated union some debate. has anybody seen the african union where is the african union I think James, the where is the African Union? <laughs> Addis, yeah. Addis. As someone said. <laughs> yes. uh, the particular relevance of this is for years, but yes. increasingly with Mali, the African Union has been talking about a standby force that African troops would be able to intervene in terms of a crisis. And despite those promises over a long period of time, uh, that, that hasn't happened. The African efforts have mainly been diplomatic and they've been concentrated not through the AU but through IGAD. Mm -hmm. So IGAD's uh, presidents have, have visited, there's been a, a summit in Nairobi. But you tell me, IGAD is a regional grouping. What does IGAD stand for? Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Right, so that's think, a regional yeah. grouping. Sorry, yeah, regional on. grouping, but yeah. was involved in the negotiations yeah. that led to the CPA yeah. in 2005, yeah. so has historical relevance uh, because of that. CPA, Comprehensive Peace Agreement. I'm a journalist, I hate acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, and so the negotiations then that are happening in Addis Ababa, or not happening depending on your perspective because they're going quite slowly, are through the, inter do I have to say intergovernmental authority yes. on development? Yes, you do. that. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. So there has right. been a diplomatic effort, but there has not been uh, a military effort as some would have wanted. Okay, right, we're getting lots of hands going up now, so I'm going to ask people to be quick. Let us come to the front and uh, these two ladies and then the gentleman here. I'm just going to part stand up because I'm really short. You won't be able to see who the little voice is. Um, I'm Georgette from Oxfam, and um, I just wanted to quickly add to the comments that were being made before we went on to the African Union section. Um, I work in the media team for Oxfam, and I spent quite a while um, living in South Sudan a year or so ago, and I've continued working on the issues. And this, the situation when obviously these things flare up and organisations need to look after themselves as well as continue working to help people on the ground of course is a really challenging one as we've already discussed but part of that challenge that hasn't been brought up so far is that of course it's really important that you're also employing national staff and organizations like Oxfam is investing and in making sure that we are helping to grow our teams on the ground for the long term both in terms of our humanitarian response in areas like Maban and in terms of our longer term development programs because we're doing both as other organizations are and of course to do that effectively you've got to have national and international staff so when we're talking about our programs having to massively scale back because of the safety of our staff as well as um, everything else happening it's not a simple choice of all the international people running back to London because they want to have their Christmas that wasn't what happened and the reality is is that a lot of our national staff when they were at Juba airports they were the wrong tribe newer tribe etc and they were getting attacked even trying to get in on planes out to Nairobi themselves so it's it's not you know it is not a there's the white face in there yeah. and everybody's extracting themselves and you know and and our organization I know we now have obviously had to take people out but we're also putting people Okay, thank you very much. Good point. Uh, Lady next to you, you had a point uh, to make. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Sandra I'm a communication advisor. Did some capacity Adam building. Adam Smith. Did some capacity you building in the Ministry of Blah Blah. I met the Ministry of Blah Blah. Briefly. Uh, um, blah Blah. <laughs> yeah. Just, um, uh, I recently read Emma's War. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to the middle of it again now. Yeah, slightly hypothetical question. Emma McCoon was a British aid worker married to Tariq Rashar and seemed to have a moderating influence on him. She's dead now. I wondered if she was still alive. Do you think that would have made a difference to anything uh, in terms of how he would have acted? Also, in the book, it, it really described very clearly how savage were the relationships between the newer and the
the Dinka and the massacres. And I'm just wondering if there's been any progress on, on the way that conflicts are resolved between the tribes in the last 10, 15 years, uh, so that they cannot be exploited question. in the way they are. Let's put that one to, to Tom. I don't know if you knew Emma. I mean, many people in this room will have known Emma. No, actually, I've, I've read the book, which is yes. Emma's Ward. Actually, very well recommended, a very good book. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, it's a good point. I think when you talk about the Dinka and the Nuer, it's, it's a very complex situation. These are, actually, the, the Dinka and the Nuer are the extreme form of what most South Sudanese tribes are. So this kind of cattle herding uh, people is spread all over the majority of South Sudan. And the culture is the same. They're normally ethnocentric. They, 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 are, they, they, they you know, they practice, uh, you know, animal, you know, cattle rustling and warfare and all this. And these things now are being transformed into the modern era. In the past, they had their mechanisms for resolving issues, and there's mm -hmm. a very famous example between the Nuer and the Dinka, where a reconciliation was made. It's called Wunlid reconciliation, uh, and that was quite successful. It actually stopped a lot of low-level sort of violence. The problem is, at this political level, this is rare. You know, traditionally, the Dinka themselves, for example, are an umbrella of a, a group of people who speak this particular language. And, but they're actually divided into politically separate, discrete units. The same things for the Nuer. So in the past, as our you know, generation of my grandfather and my father grew up, if one Dinka group fought one Nuer group, the rest of the Nuer and the Dinka are, are neutral because they saw themselves as one people. Uh, the problem now is how do you remove the system of justice that existed then? It, it existed based on two things. One is retribution. Uh, uh, and, and you know, if you kill someone, there is blood money, which is cattle, pay, done. If you don't pay it, there will be further death, you know, as a result of revenge. So this was the order, and this order worked. The problem now is because we are trying to grapple with Western ideas of, mm -hmm. of, of, of justice, which our people are resistant to it, even the, including the educated people like here or, or, or real. And therefore, we don't have the mechanisms to, to actually resolve these things amongst each other. Um, Are the traditional systems built into um, the new justice system or, or at all or attempt, not? But it's just a very, it's a, it's a feeble attempt, really. Right. They, they haven't really tried hard to build this. But, you know, they still go to the chiefs, talk to the chiefs. Like at the moment, they're talking to the chiefs, and the chiefs are trying to go between the people. And they are very effective. But traditionally and is that going on now as part of this thing? Are there other initiatives going yes, on yes, that we're not hearing about? Oh, absolutely. In Juba yeah. at the moment, you know, the chiefs mm -hmm. are going to the houses. Actually, the chiefs mm -hmm. are trying to enlist the people who have been killed, mm -hmm. Nuer chiefs, Dinka chiefs, and also Equatorian chiefs. Mm -hmm. They are going through all the houses, and they are going to the UN, uh, you know, uh, camps, interviewing individuals and seeing who is missing, who is not missing, who has been... Maybe they should be in Addis as well. Absolutely. So, you know, this, this, uh, this mechanism is there. So there's this traditional rivalry that maybe has to be taken into account when we're trying to resolve our political differences. Okay, could thank I, you. Could I just yes, add yes, two yes. quick things on that? Um, the first one is, I think, on the traditional mechanism, it's absolutely valid, but the scale of modern weaponry has made things very, very difficult to resolve mm. now because in the yeah. past it was two people killed or three people killed. Now everyone has an AK-47 and you saw it in the inter-ethnic yeah. conflicts of the last couple of years and you're talking about 500 or 600 people killed in a day and there aren't enough cows even in South Sudan to, to, to make up yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, so that I think is one thing that's problematic. Uh, I also... Uh, took slight objection to the idea of Emma McCoon as a restraining influence. I don't know her personally, but it smacks to me of the sort yes, of the white okay. saviour complex and, you know, they need an outsider to tell them what to do. And actually, if you look back at the 1990s when he was married to Emma, that's when all the fighting was happening and, and all Indeed the it was. killing and, and going on. So, no, I don't think that's necessarily I think that's answer. a very, very fair point. Yes, gentlemen, from, now you are from the Embassy of Sudan. Yes. But uh, that doesn't mean that you get to talk for longer than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get to make your point. Thank you very much, and thank yes. you very much to the panelists. I am the media counselor at the Embassy of the Sudan. Uh, I would like to make two points, if I may. The first is that uh, uh, we are worried and concerned about what's happening in uh, South Sudan, uh, not because of the oil, because they are the nearest people to us in the world. And we have the longest uh, border with them. I have a cousin in my family whose mother is from southern Sudan. My wife has got uh, relatives whose mothers are from southern Sudan. We have uh, 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 the, the banking system has to be regulated between the two countries. <coughs> we have a 40 billion uh, debt which we have to arrange together. There are uh, many families on 
the both sides of the border which have to be looked after. So it's not only the oil, but to say that leave the oil in the ground, uh, the, the southern Sudan relies on the oil more than us. We have got other sources of income, but they rely more than 90% on it. So if you would like to develop southern Sudan and not uh, wait for handouts from outside, you need the oil, of course, this is uh, logical. The African Union is there, and uh, the Sudan works through the African Union. IGAD is part of the African Union formula, and uh, uh, it has worked before because the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which brought about the birth of South Sudan, came through the IGAD and the African Union. Yeah. So to say that the African, where is the African Union is, is, uh, is unfair. About the refugees from the Sudan in the, in the South, there are not only refugees, there is also the Justice and Equality Movement. The Justice and Equality Movement has gone through the camps and has taken over the, what, what should be distributed to the refugees and to displaced people. They are roaming the south in the area between north and south and... Let me tell you, just a, the Justice and Equality Movement is one of the rebel groups fighting in Darfur. Go on, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, their aim is to disrupt relationship between north and south Sudan. S uh, Sudan is not taking part in the current conflict, not involved in the current conflict. Dude, but let, let me interrupt because I'd like to ask a question. Does Sudan have a position on the current conflict in the south? Can you tell us what it is briefly? The position is that uh, the Sudan supports the democratically elected government and the democratically elected president who has signed with the Sudan a cooperation agreement and has kept his word so far. And we are keeping our uh, part of the bargain until now. So we are not taking sides, but we support the democracy. And do you see a role for uh, Sudan in resolving this crisis? Oh, yeah, of course. President Bashir has expressed more than once readiness to help and readiness to mediate. And several political parties in the north have tried to mediate also. Uh, some people have gone even in personal uh, capacity to try and mediate mm -hmm. between the two sides. The, we were one country and one people until two and a half years ago. Indeed. However, Thank you there very are different much. views on it. Thank you. Right. There was, yes, this gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you wait for the. Um, now, I see a notebook. This makes me scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. Uh, so, my name is Martin Mortad. I'm from South Sudan. I'm Thomas's brother. So. Ah, <laughs> okay. Right, okay. Uh, what uh, I actually wanted to ask is on line of, of, uh, of Emma's question. So, we know there is a there was a prophet called Munding who prophesied that there's going to be somebody who is left-handed, who has a, a gap, a tooth gap, or <laughs> and uh, who's, who's going to rule uh, the the new country and so on. Now, what is the bearing of that prophecy on 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 our new leader, <laughs> Riyak Machar? So uh, that, that's that's a question for James and Thomas. And the next question is, uh, I'm a little bit worried about Hilda Jensen. Maybe you can advise us, because she's being blamed on both sides. Uh, and we know she has done a lot, really, for South Sudan. But uh, recently, I saw an article that was published by some uh, group in, in, in Washington accusing her that she's on, on the side of uh, President Selfa. And also, yesterday, there was a demonstration in Juba. And I saw one of the... Uh, uh, the slogans that was there that uh, we, we don't want Hilda Johnson anymore. She's she's uh, the, the local story in Juba that she was the one who have uh, hidden Riyag Machar and she helped Riyag Machar to escape. So I don't know what, what so, sort of advice would you give her. But anyway, thank you okay, very much. You. Okay, the first one for people who don't know is there's a prophecy um, that a left handed gap tooth guy will rule South Sudan, and Riyak Machar is both gap tooth and left handed. So, <laughs> this is one of these things that gets talked about. Um, uh, any other pro any prophets in the room? No. I don't know why he looks at me. No <laughs> prophets. Um, Hilda Johnson, she's the UN representative, and people are blaming her for various things. Any advice? Well, I mean, I think if she's being blamed by many groups and many people, then she must be doing some good. Mm -hmm. It's when you have a completely useless UN people who nobody even knows the name of, let alone blame, 
that you realize that uh, how ineffective they are. So I, I think uh, Hilda Johnson actually has done a great deal since independence, and she knows the country well. And I'm not here to defend. I mean, you know my views on the UN. But as far as Hilda Johnson is, is concerned, who I knew when she was Norwegian minister, she's done, I think, she has a good understanding. And, and within the politics of the region, the country, and the greater UN politics as well, I think the current UN mission is doing as good a job uh, as possible. When I was referring to the UN peacekeepers, mm -hmm. uh, what I was trying to say, uh, perhaps didn't say it very well, is was that I don't think uh, international UN peacekeepers uh, are going to uh, juxtaposition themselves between the armed groups of the of uh, the government and uh, the mm -hmm. Machar. That's not what's going to happen. But the UN does have a role in terms of confidence building, in terms of political processes and all those kinds of things, but not in terms of peace. And I think Hilda Johnson and, 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 the, on, and recently, I think the UN is doing a great job on the humanitarian side. I think uh, Toby Lanzer, who's the deputy mm -hmm. of, of uh, Hilda Johnson, who's a, who's a humanitarian coordinator, they and others are there doing stuff which in the old days the UN wouldn't, wouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. So I would say I think uh, good for her and good for the, good for the UN uh, team on the ground. But the UN cannot do it all on its own. And to think that this problem can be solved by outsiders, uh, whether or not it's the UN or the African Union, is, I think, letting the people who have the differences on the ground be given an alibi to actually not solve the problem for themselves. Yep. Gone are the days of external intervention. Uh, in these matters. Even political intervention can only go with the grain of local willingness and local capacities. And I think the wisdom in Addis should be to go with that grain rather than try to make peace if there is not peace uh, you know, uh, that they're not ready for. Okay, very good. Right, we had some questions at the back. Um, the lady at the back and then the lady in this row here. Yeah. Hi, um, I'll, sh I'll keep it short. The first question is, who are the key individuals who should not be left out of the peace negotiations? Mm -hmm. And then a second question is following a story run by the economists um, that due to an illness of Safakir, his character changed slightly. Ah. I don't know if there's any, any sort of comments on that because I've never seen it before. Okay, that's interesting. I'm going to take this lady and then we'll put that to the panel. Do you want to pass the microphone to the lady here? Yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dana Wilkins with Global Witness. Um, I was just wondering, given its historical role and the personalities that are involved here, uh, what role, if any, is oil likely to play in either the escalation or the resolution of the crisis? Okay. Let me, Thomas, let me put the first two to you. Any key individuals who really should be involved in any peace deal? And uh, Salva Kiir, has he had an illness and his character changed? I, I haven't heard that, I'm, I'm, but I'm not surprised to hear that. Because actually the way we live in South Sudan is by rumor. And that <coughs> question is exactly similar to what Martin raised there. That, you know, uh, the Nuer legend, you know, who is Mundeng, very famous uh, uh, prophet, who predicted the coming of the British and the civil war between the southerners or the black people against the British and then against North Sudanese. And the genocide of them and the ultimate liberation but, but then did he predict what was going to happen now? And then an <laughs> ultimate, an ultimate Dinkan war, conf a Dinkan world confrontation that's going to end up with a descendant that is left-handed, and oh. so these things. Okay. No, it's the same category. This is the way uh, information is 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 spread, and it's very dangerous, obviously. And I think the people in charge, the politicians, and so on, should deal with these kind of rumors discuss them in the open so that people can understand and, and know them to be rubbish. Also, you can bring in even the religious leaders who will come and give us the correct interpretation of these. Because these mundane prophecies are very abstract songs that are interpreted and reinterpreted every time. Mm. So, uh, they, but they should not be allowed to cloud this. And I think the, this rumor about, you know, key character changing as well, it's the first time I've heard it, but I could just exactly equally have heard it in Juba as well. So. You know, uh, th that's my response to that. And what about key people who need to be involved in the uh, peace talks? Do you have any particular names that you want to put out there? I think if I would give any sort of praise to the government is the uh, ability, their imagination uh, and the forthright uh, thinking that allowed them to send a, a good representative of South Sudanese. One example is Lam Akol, who until a few months ago was living in, in Khartoum. Khartoum yeah. yeah. And who was seen as a dissident. What about the 11 people who were in prison? Maybe uh, some of them might have something to say. 
I think that's a very good point. I, th I think obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obvious. Uh, yeah. I mean, all I say, ki, ki, uh, uh, real much, I mean, Lama Code is a very good example. Yes, this the, the they 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 have to be released. That's I think most people's view. Uh, yes. Obviously, the government's view is these people were implicated in this particular coup, and any interference by pressure would amount to interfering in, in, in the, you know, in, in, in internal affairs of a sovereign country. Kiri is saying that the law will take its due course. These people will be, you know, un made answerable to what they have done and so on. So uh, it's a difficult situation. It, that seems to me, though, quite an obvious bargaining chip, though, isn't it? I mean, it's quite easy to say. Maybe he's holding on to yeah. it until yes. the last moment. I think that's, that's part of the negotiations, just as Rek Mishar not agreeing to the cessation of hostilities before was a bargaining chip on his side. I think that's a Good element point. of it. To go back to the Gangding thing uh, briefly, uh, Rek Mishar plays on that as well, too, didn't he? I think he took his staff personally, I believe, I read, um, to... Yeah, to, to, to use that consciously as I am the coming man, I will be leading this Governor country in the future. The world, and it's not something that just goes back, you know, hundreds of years. You have also Dak Queth, who is a, a modern day prophet who was behind the White Army and was believed to be the inspiration for their attacks on the Merle in 2011, 2012 from Piri. I think he then fled possibly to Ethiopia and people aren't sure whether he's behind, or at least I'm not sure whether he's behind this latest incarnation of the White Army which is fighting with Rekh Mashar. So um, it's not an empty question I think. People's mm, beliefs is very, very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about um, the thing about Salva Kiir being ill and his character changing and so on? Is that something that you came across when you were there? Was, was it a discussion? There were the reports of him going, I think, to South Africa for medical treatment. Yeah. Um, whether there was a specific link to a character change, uh, I don't know. That seems like an, e an easy jump to make, but quite a lot harder to prove. I do think there is an interesting evolution in his character, though, because for a long time he was seen as the great conciliator, and it was the mm. big tent strategy, and he brought in uh, the militias allied to Khartoum under Paulino Matip in a way that I think John Garang probably wouldn't have done. And he brought in people who rebelled against him, declared amnesties. Some of the rebels ended up being, being killed in fighting or ambushes or other events, but many others were brought in. Uh, and so his, his identity, it seemed, politically, was one who could accept compromise for the, for the good of the nation. And yet I think over the last year, his positions have increasingly hardened, um, whether that's due to people around him or, his own, or the increasing challenge. It seems to me quite likely that he doesn't want Reg Mishar in power at any cost whatsoever because of the historical dimension to all this, among others. But someone who is seen as bringing people in and conciliatory has not acted like that, I don't feel, over the last year or so. Um, going back to uh, dissent within the party, the way journalists have been dealt with, oh, yes. uh, things like that. Um, and part of the problem, true, is, is that everything is within the SPLM. There is no real... Lamacol is the opposition leader, but has little weight in Parliament or outside. So everything is within the boundaries of the SPLM. And if one person has effective control over that, it becomes much harder, I think. Uh, so and can I interrupt you there to ask you the, the next question, which is about oil? Because we've heard Mukesh's uh, view on oil. Tell me what role you think oil um, may play in, in this conflict. Well, Global Witness does a lot of work on oil, probably knows much better than, than say, anyone on this panel. Uh, mm. I don't agree with the idea of getting rid of uh, all the oil for 15 years. This is 98% of government revenue. It's the only source of income. Use the oil to develop the country, to develop agriculture, to put in roads around the country. There was a program, uh, I think it was going to be 9 to 10 billion of building roads that were going to link up every state uh, capital, the 10 states, to, to Juba and internationally to Ethiopia, to Uganda. Once the oil shutdown happened as part of this row with Khartoum in January 2011, all that stopped. The roads were no longer being built. It wasn't possible to get farmers' produce to market. It wasn't possible to develop agriculture or health or all these things that so desperately needed after all those decades of conflict. So my argument would be use the oil uh, to find, but use it constructively and find mechanisms to stop corruption so that the oil money goes to developing the other areas of the economy because the oil will run out. Uh, eventually, and South Sudan needs to be productive after that, and that comes through agriculture, essentially. Uh, but there's also another danger of stopping the oil, and I'm not a technical person, but maybe Global Witness can answer this, but the more you, if you shut down a pipeline twice, the danger is you can't open it up again. So starting it, stopping it, starting it is just not a solution. I think the oil needs to flow, but South Sudan and its leaders need to make better use of it. Is it but flowing the at the moment? Is it flowing at the moment? 
it is. The latest figure I saw reported was something like 100,000 barrels at separation. It was 350,000 barrels. So partly it's been affected by the latest fighting, the fact that the rebels have control of some oil fields in Unity State. Partly it's because qualified personnel have left those oil fields. And partly production was simply not as high as it had been mm. previously because of the after effects of the shutdown, which only ended a few months ago. But, no, I think I, I of course agree with you that uh, uh, the, if the revenue from the oil was used in a in a efficient, effective, mm. and honest manner, it would only do good for the development of the country. No one can disagree with that. But that's but it's easy to say that. Yes. You know, the the reason we have all this corruption and the reason we don't have the institutional capacity uh, which allows uh, this accountability and the proper absorption is the reason why we are partly in this mess. And the history of resource poor, sorry, resource rich yes. conflict affected countries in Africa uh, you know uh, is uh, not very not very very helpful at all and uh, I don't think we should be I don't think South Sudan's development should be mortgaged on or driven by oil or the costs of keeping the infrastructure going or not less than 10 percent of uh, Sudan's uh, 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 arable land is actually being used in, in a way so of course you, you're saying they use the oil revenue to develop agriculture but I don't think that is the only way to do this uh, in a way and for mo the vast majority of the population of, of South Sudan has been outside the cash economy for decades I mean even now if you go to parts of South Sudan yep. they haven't seen the pound note if you like see in yep. that context uh, I think the oil is in a sense uh, irrelevant for day-to-day -to -day concerns and then final argument in this and I'm sure my very good friend which I'm pleased to see from uh, from embassy may react to this is you know, this, uh, Sudan's uh, share of the oil revenue actually goes to a genocidal regime which is uh, run by a president who is indicted by the International Criminal Court and is used to arm uh, Bashir and his army who then inflict more and more atrocities onto Darfur, onto the Nuba Mountains and the Blue Nile. So I think the stopping of the oil would be excellent in terms of an <coughs> economic embargo on Sudan and in any case I think South Sudan uh, will in time build the uh, institutional capacity to use this oil wisely for the benefit in the future. This is the reason for okay, delaying these things. Millicent, are we, can we go on till nine? Um, not quite till nine, but just quarter two. Because we were late starting. Okay, let's have a few more. Before I talk to anybody else, is there anybody from the South Sudan, anybody from the South Sudan government or embassy here? No, anybody actually representing the they government? Were, they were invited. But they, they were invited, but they haven't come. That's a shame, because it would have been nice to hear from them. Okay, um, where shall I go to? There's a gentleman there, yes, with the glasses. Thank you very much. I, I happen to be another Mortad, Thomas's brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I think there's a total takeover tonight. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to appreciate this initiative. Yes. Uh, as a South Sudanese, I think we all feel a shame with, with what's happened recently because the world gave us so much uh, support and there was so much belief in, in, in the the creation of this new nation. Obviously, as, as Mukesh said earlier, uh, we're a nation in, in the making, and as a result, uh, there's bound to have been problems at, this, at the very start of, of our coming into existence. But I think South Sudan is full of so much contradictions in the sense that f uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where there was a whole euphoria and sovereign nationalism really was, was mm. alive and kicking, we, we evolved in such a way, had we become independent then, we probably would have, wouldn't be going through what we're going through today. But nevertheless, uh, the road that we've taken uh, is full of contradictions because we had democracy, a democratic system in the 70s. <laughs> today, democracy seems to be very alien to our leaders. Our leaders, the caliber of our leaders today is totally different from the, the moralistic, committed and, and genuine leaders that we had way back then. And yet again, we, we've now become independent with so much resources that other Africans never had. <laughs> uh, although Marcus said, Marcus said uh, we should close the oil, the oil was closed for a year and a half. And this is one of the causes of the problem now, because clearly people think the country came to a halt, but um, when it re-kicks, then it should be somebody else at the, at the helm of the whole thing. So what I really hope for South Sudan, and, and I don't know if, I'm sure Thomas has said a lot of it, is we wish we can have like a Marshall Plan if the world really wants to help us, is not to, to use this current peace initiative to impose a grand collision, which doesn't work, or to impose another temporary deal, <laughs> which we know is, is not going to last. What we really need is, is a way to stop our leaders, uh, look for a, a system of governance at work. In my view, a rotational government around the three greatest states of the South, 
uh, where leadership evolves. Basically, if we have one set, whoever wants it, it will come to them within a, 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 a defined period. But, but most of all is to get to persuade our leaders to embrace m modern ways of developing this country. And there's a lot of goodwill, and that will should be, uh, we should access that will and, and build this country with all the resources that it has. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Um, right, more questions. Um, Sarah, do you have a question? Yeah, I guess. Hi, wait, have the uh, microphone, yeah. Hi, um, uh, Sarah Wilson from the media team at World Vision, um, just incidentally an agency that's both development and humanitarian and is still there. Um, <laughs> but uh, my question is more about the oil. Um, I know very little about it really, but it is, you know, as you say, as Mukesh says, very difficult to properly regulate it. But does anybody, can anybody consider or put forward any sort of blueprint that that oil could be properly taxed so some of that revenue could be used for development in a realistic way. Is there any possibility of that happening in anything like the it, Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that, that that's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure we can we can take that one in because basically that's you know yes, if the government functioned and you had a, you had a, a government that actually worked as a proper government, then yes, you could. But but, um, but even putting pressure on the people that are now taking the oil out. I mean, is that something that international pressure can be brought to bear? Let's ask Thomas that question. I think we have agreements in place where the um, revenue is shared equitably. There is no, uh, no South Sudanese or Sudanese, for that matter, would say that the oil is being stolen. It's not being stolen by outsiders. Uh, the deal that is in, in between you know, the Chinese, the Indian companies, Malaysian companies, uh, Sudan and South Sudan, is an, it's an open and I wouldn't say totally transparent, but hopefully it will become more mm. transparent. Uh, there's nothing in there in terms of the oil being stolen. The problem is we have sufficient revenue coming from the oil that should be useful mm. running the country. As, as James said, actually should be used for developing the mm. infrastructure that will then lead to the uh, true economic development of our country. But that's been not being done properly. So that's the issue. It's the issue of how the oil money is being used rather than... But is that just a broader governance question, really? It's about how the government operates or doesn't operate. Is that what it's about? Absolutely. I mean, you, 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 you it's entirely a governance it. question. The last yeah. thing you want is an oil Iraq program like uh, yeah. we had in the, in the case of Saddam. So, I, I mean, I don't think there's any shortcuts to this. I think this is why I'm arguing so passionately. Don't treat oil as if it is some kind of super commodity, which is, which is uh, South Sudan's salvation. It isn't. It's a curse. Yeah. All right, Mukesh, you made the point. Right. Uh, we've got we've got very little time left, so I'm going to take two or three quick ones. I've seen you two in the front and a couple at the back. So, gentlemen, there first, very quick. Yep. Hi, I'm Mark Dubois from MSF. Uh, in the past, uh, fighting in let's say in Darfur would have spillover in South Sudan. There were consequences across, and you know, same as fighting in South Sudan might have consequences in 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 Darfur. And then there was quite a bit of international involvement from Chad, from Ethiopia, over mm. the years of this conflict. And I'm wondering, if this situation in South Sudan persists, does, does anyone see, you know, what are the likely, uh, where's the spillover? The spillover, and yeah. Likely? And this, that's a yeah. very good question. Refugees, Ethiopia. Can I just take a couple more and then come to you guys? Yes. Hi, I was just uh, curious as the current state of the media in the com in the country, mm. and if uh, any uh, there's been any political influence on it uh, since the conflict started. Media in South Sudan. Good question. Let's do these two at the front. Do we do speakers or? Just very well, quick two questions. One uh, very small. The Nuba tribesmen. I think a million people. I'm Survival International. Uh, the press has been chucked out of there, and the NGOs. Uh, does anybody have any idea what's happening to them? What's uh, the war criminal Bashir has talked about exterminating a lot of them. The big question: the Chinese, I gather, are refusing to build an oil f a pipeline out to the south, which would liberate the south from the north. And the north is charging extortionate uh, transportation rates through the pipeline. So is this, in a great power sense, a danger if the southern government and the security situation weakens and Bashir gets ambition southward? Well, I, yeah, okay, I think that's a bit of a long-term question for two minutes. Yes, Hello, go I'm Emily. I'm not related to Thomas. <laughs> I do have a question for Thomas. Yeah. It's also related to media. I don't know if you heard, but there was a um, petition circulating recently in response to a report um, by The Guardian about the situation in South Sudan just before Christmas. Um, the tagline underneath the heading was um, first Western journalist into South Sudan and the petitioners were um, lobbying the editor of The Guardian you know, for more balanced reporting and also to take consideration of South Sudanese journalists. And I'm interested to hear what you think of the 
reporting on the issue well, from within in this South country. Sudan. Very good. Okay, let me, uh, because we're coming to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through everybody to answer whichever questions I choose that they should answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to do spillover. Mukesh, um, are you concerned about spillover and where would you see that as a danger? Oh, totally. The history of the Sudan region, I mean, you know, the kind of treat this as a big region, is entirely of the interconnectedness of these conflicts, mm. whether it's pre separation Sudan or post separation Sudan or neighboring countries. And we know from the history of conflict in the continent of Africa as a whole that no conf conflict can remain confined. Khartoum is right to be worried about what is going on in South Sudan. And it is in Sudan's legitimate interest to be concerned about what's happening in its neighbor and the other way around uh, as well, you see. So you can be sure that this thing is going to spill across in many different forms, not just with the flow of people already into Uganda and, and so on, we are already happening, but also in the flow of uh, arms, in the flow of ideas, in the flow of uh, many, many other dangerous, mm. uh, dangerous factors. So the only way to deal with this is in a holistic way. There will be no peace and stability in the bigger Sudan region until all the interconnected conflicts are solved, whether it's Darfur, whether it's a border dispute, say, in, the, in uh, Nuba, Blue Nile, and so on and so forth. It is only when the international friends of uh, both Sudans take that perspective and in a magnanimous and in a, in a, in a non-partisan uh, way try to address those together, including the grievances and inju injustice of the people, that we're going to see long-term stability across the Sudans. And okay. if we don't do that, then it's going to run across other regions as well. Um, Heather, are you worried um, about cross-border problems from a humanitarian perspective? And also, very briefly, is this affecting the, the Nuba at all? Yeah, so um, definitely our, our teams in Ethiopia are going to um, to evaluate the, the needs on the Ethiopian side. We've just started programs in Kenya where the refugees are crossing there and equally in Uganda because you know, there's something like 6,000 refugees are crossing a day. Mm -hmm. It's getting really, really quite big. So yes, it is becoming a wider regional problem in that sense and we are going to have to put in the, the extra the extra resources. Um, for the Nuba, I mean, what we see is uh, is our programs in Nida and then the refugees mm, that the refugees. have fled there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the situation, like I said, for them is, is quite dire because they can't go back and if they don't have the assistance they need they can't stay so, so, okay then I'm going to finish on the media questions uh, James the media both um, two issues really the the way the government treats the the foreign media and also the role of the the domestic media in South Sudan the way the government treats the foreign media uh, it's much easier to be a foreign journalist than it is a South Sudanese journalist I think to be perfectly honest um, lots of South Sudanese journalists have complained about restraints their work. I have journalist friends who've been knocked down in the National Assembly. Um, some people have had uh, threats. Uh, some people feel there are limits to the things that they can uh, report upon, um, much as is the case in, in Sudan, to be perfectly honest. It's copying the Sudanese model, uh, on, not just on media. Uh, we, and has it become more history. repressive for South Sudanese journalists over the two years of independence, do you think? Yes, I think so. I think so. But I, I haven't noticed a, a massive uptick since the start of this conflict three weeks ago. Mm. But South Sudanese journalists have said there are certain issues they don't feel comfortable or, or, or safe uh, reporting. And what about the foreigners? Because we know that they, I know at least one foreign journalist who was told she was a spy and asked to leave. Told to leave. Yeah, uh, I think this is a particular case in which uh, two reporters did some very hard-hitting reporting from largely uh, newer people in camps in uh, UN bases in Juba um, who uh, said horrible things that happened to them and people they knew. Uh, there was a perception by some, certainly in government, that they gave a one-sided picture, or at any rate, a, a, a close-up of one particular piece uh, of, of the picture. Um, and therefore there was, I think, some hostility towards them because of this. Uh, also, uh, Mohamed Adal, who's an Al Jazeera reporter, a very well-respected reporter, was asked to leave the country as well um, after some of his, uh, some of his reporting. Um, I think it is an extremely difficult thing to report on it the events of an entire country. Lots of horrible things are happening in Bor and Bentiu and there are no journalists there right now. So a slightly one-sided picture has emerged because mm. most journalists have mainly just been able to get to Juba. To so Juba, I yeah. I noticed that Alistair Leithead from the BBC has got within 20, uh, 20 miles of um, Bentiu today. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, just tell us a little bit to finish. The, the media in South Sudan, how is it representing what's going on? Do you think that South Sudanese journalists are able to to tell the story? 
Uh, not at all. Uh, Mm. Yeah, I would agree with James that it's actually, I don't think journalism has changed between the period before the disturbances and now. But in general, under, under, the, under the SPNM government since independence, I think that there's a lot of lip service being paid for, you know, freedom of expression and, and journalism. But in practice, there is what in South Sudan people think is, uh, people call um, self-censorship, where you know there are areas you don't get, you, you don't reach. Also, the, the politicians are very remote. They are not, you know, interviewed. I mean, James would not go with his microphone to Safakir and ask him difficult questions. I think, going back I, to I did, international... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did he answer? Uh, he tried, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, he's a politician. He answers things he... Yeah, I heard, but... but Mm. Yeah, South Sudanese uh, journalists on a day-to-day -day basis don't get that ex yeah. Uh, yeah. chance to do. Mm. And I think if the outside world is to help, that's, I think, one of the crucial things. I talked about financial management. I've talked about the legal system. But next is to protect South Sudanese journalists. There are some young people who are very, very good and who could do mm. you know, world-class work, but they're not being allowed to and they're being they're threatened. Being okay, um, I'm very sorry that we have to pull this to a close here. There are more questions. There's much more that the panel can tell us, but let me just first of all thank you all very much for coming and thank the panel. And I think all of us hope, pray, whatever we do for South Sudan and the people of South Sudan. Thank, thank you. you.